Please, choir, um, not so soon. Please, we still need you uh, up here. Hallelujah. It's turn to your neighbor, say, you're welcome to an encounter with the Spirit of the Lord. Tell your neighbor, you are welcome to an encounter with the Spirit of the Lord. You know, when I was praying for this service, the Holy Ghost said to me that you're not just coming for a service. You're coming for an encounter. So I hope you encounter. TBC, his masterpiece. Please, we need you on stage. I hope you are ready for an encounter today. Are you ready for an encounter? Are you ready for an encounter? You don't sound convincing. You don't sound like you're ready for an encounter. Are you ready for an encounter today? Yes. There is a sweet anointing in the sanctuary. There is a stillness in the atmosphere. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for all you have no said to do in this place today. We yield ourselves for the encounter that you have promised. We thank you for the power of your word penetrating through every soul in this place. We thank you for your word coming there with great power to convict. We thank you for your anointing that is in this place this evening, this afternoon. We thank you because every burden is, is laid down at this altar. And every problem is solved. Every question is answered. Every issue Come finds a solution down. here today Come in the name of down. Jesus. We thank you for your word that is powerful. For your word that is active. Divided into even unto the soul and the spirit. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you are set to do in this place today. There is sweet anointing in the sand. Come on, raise your hand, let's glorify Jesus. Lift up your hands and glorify Jesus. I don't know your expectations this afternoon, but I have an assurance by the Spirit of God that you have come for an encounter. I have an assurance from the Holy One of Israel that you are here for an encounter. Just lay down the burden. Just lay down the burden. Because God is here. God is here. God is here. We give you praise, Father. Blessed be your name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we worship. In Jesus' name we worship. Thank you, HMC. You may have your seat in the presence of the Lord. I like to appreciate our senior pastor, Pastor Tokwe Shaba, for this opportunity to stand here and minister on a Sunday morning. If you were in some ministries, you understand what that means. When the senior pastor is around, nobody else preaches. But Pastor Shaba, I thank you for this opportunity. I don't take it lightly at all. Now, we've been talking about life in the spirit. And today I'm going to continue in the same, in the same trend. And by God's grace, we'll be looking at life in the spirit. Then you have um, colon, the communion of the Holy Spirit. So if we're giving a topic to this message, we'll call it life in the spirit. 
the communion of the Holy Spirit. And let's look at the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. We know that scripture very well. Let me just say, can we share the grace together? Can we share the grace in fellowship? I'm sure we don't need to read it. One, two, go. The love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Hallelujah. You know, that's a very common prayer we pray in church. In fact, perhaps it's the most common prayer we pray in church. But I want us to look at that prayer very carefully. Now, that is contained in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. So I'll read it as the Bible puts it. It says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Some translations translate it as fellowship. But some translations translate it as communion. Now, whether it was, it's translated as fellowship or as communion, it doesn't capture the full meaning of what the in, initial text in the Greek was. Hallelujah. So we look at this prayer. Now, when we say the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we are actually praying three levels of access into the workings of God. We are praying three levels of relationship and three levels of access into the workings of God. Now, the love of God Right? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Now, to access the works of God, you access it through the love of God. You access the works of the Father through the love of God. So that's why the Bible says, very common scripture as well, John 3 16. That for God so loved the world. Now one thing you realize about the love of God is that the love of God does not discriminate. The love of God is the same to everybody. It is agape love. It is non-conditional. There's no condition to it. So the Bible said that for God so loved the world. The Bible did not say for God so loved the church. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. So the love of God does not discriminate whether you are a believer, an unbeliever, or a pagan, or even a murderer. The love of God does not discriminate. So the, word of, the love of God is, is accessible to the whole world, irrespective of who you are. Now, the day God will segregate you as a Christian, to love you more than an unbeliever, then the love of God is no longer agape. Because that means there's now a condition to the love of God. Praise the Lord. The Bible tells us that God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the love of God is demonstrated towards sinners, towards the whole world. It doesn't discriminate. Praise the Lord. Now, that is why you can see a Dangote is the richest man in Africa. It's because of the love of God. So, everybody in the world, irrespective of your spiritual status, is under the love of God and benefits from the love of God. Jesus put it very well in the book of Matthew chapter 5. He said, it has been said to you before, love your neighbors... And hate your enemies. He said, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for them that despitefully use you. So that you will be children of your father. Another translation said that so that you will be like your father. Who allows his son and his reign both on the godly and the ungodly. So that is why you see God gives his son and God gives his reign. Now, the sun and the rain are factors for production. So, anybody that tills the soil will get a harvest. Whether you are a Christian or a pagan, it doesn't matter. But we Christians sometimes, God has given us his sun 
and his reign just like every other believer. But we want God to come and till the soil for us. Hallelujah. And while we are there waiting for God to till the soil for us, unbelievers are tilling the soil and getting the harvest. And you are wondering, why will a dangote be the richest man in Africa? It is the love of God. It doesn't discriminate. Now, that is one level of access. So, that level of access is called the agape love of God. Praise the Lord. Now, we now have the love of God, right, produced the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, the works of the Father are accessed through the love of God. It's free for everybody. But the, 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 the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the book of Titus, chapter 2, it says that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. So because the grace of God is a product of the love of God, it is available to all men. Hallelujah. Now, that's another level of access. Now, the works of Jesus are accessible through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the grace of God is available within the boundaries of the love of God. So, everybody under the influence of the love of God can access the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. But that grace can only be accessed by believing in what Christ has done. So, this is the boundary of the love of God. This is the love of God. Right? Now, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is broadcast within that boundary. So, to step into the grace, you accept it and you come into the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the works of Christ are only accessible through the grace of Christ. So that's why you see, even though God loves the whole world, the whole world is not saved. Because the Bible said that the, the, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, but not all are saved. So you have, you have to accept that grace to step into the works and access the works of Christ. But what I'm saying now is not my message this morning. I'm just laying a foundation. It's a preamble. Right? So when you accept the grace, you step, the, when you accept the grace of Christ, you step into the grace of Christ, then you can now access the works of Christ. So the works of righteousness, the works of, of, of salvation, which Christ has made available, is now accessible to you. Praise the Lord. Then there's a third level. And that's where I want to dwell on today. It says the communion of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Now, to access the works of the Holy Spirit, it is true communion of the Holy Spirit. So it is not an automatic thing. Just like the love of God does not automatically give you salvation, even though the grace is available within that boundary of his love, in the same way, the works of the Holy Spirit is available within the boundary of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. But how come not everybody is able to walk in these things? Because the works of the Holy Spirit is accessed only through communion with the Holy Spirit. So you might be saved. You may have accepted the grace of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. But you see that you are, you, it's difficult to walk in the Spirit. Like Pastor Tokwe has been teaching, I said, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now you still see yourself struggling with these things. And the Bible says, walk in the Spirit. And it is difficult to walk in the Spirit. Because the works of the Spirit are accessible through the communion of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Are we... Are we getting somewhere this morning? And let me just talk a bit about the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit of God, Pastor Kwe has taught us, it is not a force, neither is it oil, neither is it water. 
Neither is the Holy Spirit a lesser God than the Father and the Son. There's an illustration I watched Pastor Chris as in give concerning the, 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 the person of the Holy Spirit. Right? He, okay, I think I should just do it. I.K., please, can you come with your chair? And put your, bring your chair here. Bring your chair here. Praise the Lord. Just put a chair and sit down majestically. Right? Uh, Henry, please come. Come and stand here. Can everybody see I.K.? Can everybody see I.K.? Please put your leg down. Sit majestically. No, majestically is not to cross your leg. Praise the Lord. Now, I.K. is going to play the role of God the Father. Now, the Bible tells us in the book of John chapter 16 that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. You get? So, this is God sitting on his throne. And he wants to do a work here. Right? The Bible says he proceeds from the Father. So, he comes out from the Father. And he's doing a work here. Now, while he's doing a work here, he needs to do another work here. Now, the Holy Spirit walking here, now, what we have here is called the Spirit of God. Because it comes out of the Father. The Father is sitting on his seat. The Spirit is walk, doing his work. Right? Completely independent of the Father. So, when he is here, he has his will. He has his mind. He has what he wants to accomplish. Now, while, while the Spirit is walking in this place, this, God wants to walk there as well. He proceeds from the Father. He comes out of the Father. He's walking here. So while he's walking there, he's walking here, and if you need to walk somewhere else, he proceeds from the Father. All of them complete God, independent of the Father. Now, so how about the Son? Scientists have been able to show that your voice carries unique traits that can be used to identify you. So when they analyze your voice, they can know you. Right? Sorry. Sorry to put you on the spot, our sister that just came today. Please come. Our sister, yes, please. Sorry. Come. Praise the Lord. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. I just want to... Wow, isn't she beautiful? First of all, what's your name? Adese. Wow, I have another Adese sitting very close to you. Minister Max, please come. Do you know this lady? Oh, you don't know her. Boy, you are seeing her. But you said you don't know her. If after service, both of you sit together and interact for one hour, if I ask you this question, what would you say? You say you know her because you have interacted with her. She has spoken to you. I've heard her words. So you can begin to tell this is the kind of person she is. Thank you. Please go back to your seat. What I'm trying to say, Christ is the word of God. Do you understand? So you do not know a person until you have listened to the word of the person. So the person's word is an expression of the person. So that's why the Bible said that Christ is the express image of God. Because God spoke forth his word and he became a material being. So is that different from God? Okay, let's see. So God speaks now, the Bible did not say the words of God, but the word of God, which carries the person of God. He speaks forth his word, right? And he becomes a person. Would you say the word, the spirit walking in these different places, and the father, are they different? It is the same person. Because your word is you. Hallelujah. So what we're saying is that the spirit proceeds from the father. He is the father. 
Because Jesus Christ said, my father who lives in me do well the work. So who was he referring to as my father who lives in me? He was the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the Father and the Son is the Father. That's why when people try to unravel the mystery of Trinity, it's like, how can you say three God is in one? But it is one God. The Spirit and the Word are not different from the person. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. You can take your seat. Now, what I'm trying to say, let us know is this. Each person has the Holy Spirit complete. The same Spirit proceeding from the Father in each and every one of us is a complete Holy Spirit. With all the abilities and qualities of God. We don't have the Holy Spirit in partial parts. Maybe when we all come together, the Holy Spirit will be complete. No. We all are an embodiment of the Spirit of God. We all have the Spirit of God complete. Praise the Lord. And the Spirit of God lives in us. So that means we have the whole of God living in us. And Pastor Tukwe has taught us that it is not cohabiting with our spirit. Because the Bible says that he that is joined to God is one spirit with him. So the spirit of God is one with our spirit. So you cannot decipher where the separating line is. He is one with our spirit. Praise the Lord. And it indwells us. And the Bible says, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. <laughs> you know, Jesus says something about the Holy Spirit. He said, the world cannot receive him. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit, the works of the Holy Spirit, the communion of the Holy Spirit is only accessible within the boundary of the grace of God. So even though God loves the world, the Bible, Jesus said that the world cannot receive him. So he's only available. Let me use that word. It's only available within the bandwidth of the grace of God. So if you have found grace with God, you've come into righteousness, the, whole, the communion of the Holy Spirit is available for you. And look at this scripture that we just read. He said, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So it is for everybody. It is not an exclusive preserve of a certain class of ministers. You know, there are some people that hear God. Ah, that man, they hear God. Clean, clear. The Bible said it is for all. Praise the Lord. The scripture we've been taught over and over again says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. So, by divine providence, the grace of God has bettered you, has bettered us in the spirit. So, we are spirit beings. But living in the spirit and walking in the spirit are two different things. To walk in the spirit is by communing with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that those that are led by the spirit of God are the sons of God. Now, how are you led by somebody that you cannot see? The Holy Spirit is not a physical being. So don't expect that as in he's walking and you're following behind him. No. It's in the place of talking to you. That you begin to understand his direction and begin to move in that direction. The book of Hebrews chapter 4, he said there remained a rest for the people of God. Now what rest is the Bible talking about? What rest are we talking about? There remained a rest. And he says that a man that has come into rest has himself seized from all his works. Last Sunday, Pastor Tokwe was teaching us about the, the similarities 
between a man that is drunk and a man that is filled with the spirit of God. Now, that man that is drunk eh, has ceased from his works. Because at that moment of intoxication, no matter what that man is going through, it is immaterial to him. He is under the control and dictate of the alcohol controlling him. So you see a man who has just lost everything. He will stand on the street and he will start dancing. Because the alcohol is telling him to dance. So at that point, it is not about what he's thinking. It's about what the alcohol is doing. So it's just flowing on top of the alcohol. But when that influence clears from his eyes, he comes back to his state and you see him depressed again. And he can't wait to go and grab the alcohol again. The Bible says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Ghost. And the man that has come into rest has ceased from his works. Now, what rest is Jesus talking about? A man that is led by the Spirit of God is at rest. Because he has ceased from all his works. He's been led by the Holy Spirit. All he has to do is to follow. He's under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now all he has to do is to just be in step with what the Spirit is doing. Let's read Hebrews chapter 4. Hallelujah. The communion of the Holy Spirit. The communion of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'll read verse 1, then I'll skip. It says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. We are Bible students. What is the promise of the Father? What is the promise of the Father? It's the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Father is not the cars or the houses. It's the Holy Spirit. So the promise of the Father is the Holy Spirit. So when the Bible says, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, what, is, what are we talking about? That is the promise of, his, of the Father. The Holy Spirit. Since a promise remains of entering his rest. So let us fear. Lest any of you seem to have come short of it. How do you come short of it? That is the next question. If the promise of the Father is the Holy Spirit, and that promise is rest, how do you come short of it? Let's look at verse 7. I'll take the B part. Okay, let me read everything. So again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, he said, Today, if you will hear his voice, Today, if you will hear his voice, Today, if you will hear his voice, he said, Harden not your hearts. How do you hear his voice? And I hope we know this. That today, when we say Emmanuel, we are referring to the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is God with us. When Jesus was on earth in bodily form, he was Emmanuel. Praise the Lord. But today, when we say Emmanuel, when we say Jesus, 
Santa Legedoska. Kapos ye kebrush kalanda lipo sanda lagada. John chapter 14, verse 26. Let's read that before we come back to Hebrews. I just want to make us understand something. The Holy Spirit is not the name of the Holy Spirit. Because you have a spirit in you. And that spirit is holy. The Holy Spirit is not his name. But when you call him the Holy Spirit, he knows that you are talking about him. John chapter 14. He said, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Did you see that? He said, the helper, the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name. So the Holy Spirit responds to the name of Jesus. Are we we hearing that? The Holy Spirit which the Father will send in my name. So the Holy Spirit responds to the name of Jesus. So when you call Jesus, the Holy Spirit answers. And when the Bible says, today, if you will hear his voice, he said, do not harden your heart. Because that is how the children of Israel went into disobedience and they were disqualified from the rest that God promised them. So today, the recipe to entering his void, this is rest, is if you will hear his voice. And that's why the Bible said, therefore, be diligent to enter that rest. Be diligent to enter that rest. You know, when I began to read this scripture, I was, as in, before I gained understanding, I was, you said rest. Now you said we should be, diligent means hard work. Consistency. Keeping at it. Staying power. He said, be diligent to enter that rest. Today, if you will hear his voice and obey, you enter, you are operating in that rest. He said, but be diligent to enter that rest. The love of God, whether you know it or not, whether you accept it or not, works for you. That is why atheists, if you've interacted with any any of them, they are some of the most intelligent people you will see. And a lot of them have material resources. Now, that is the love of, whether you accept it or not, it is working for you. Now, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ needs you to take a step. And that step is to accept the work of Christ. But the communion of the Holy Spirit needs you to take a further step to stay in fellowship. Are you sure this time was correct? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So what I'm saying, the rest is in following the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because like a man under the influence of alcohol, it is no longer his calculation and his strength. It is the influence of what has taken over him. So in the same way, for a man that is filled with the Holy Spirit, it is no longer your calculation and permutations. It is following that which has taken over you. So you just hear in the morning, you're supposed to go to court. by Mr. Max. And the Bible says, and the Holy Spirit tells you, go and stand by that junction. I think Pastor Tunde Bakari shared a testimony like that. How the Holy Spirit told him to do something stupid after he lost his job. 
to wear his full court clothes and go to a club. Is it Koi club or you get? It sounded stupid. By his calculation, there's no way he would have done that. But that was the beginning of his breakthrough. Because when he got there, he met two people fighting. And immediately they needed a lawyer, he was there. Could that have been by his calculation? That is functioning from rest. Being led by the Holy Spirit. Listening, hearing his voice and obeying. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Verse 9, Hebrews chapter 4. He said, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also seized from all from his works as God did from his. He said, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. So a man that hears the voice and refuses to obey. And a man that does not hear the voice at all and continues doing this. What, what is the difference? They are all disobedient. Correct me if I'm wrong, Barrister Marx. That <laughs> in law, there is no ignorance. Whether you heard it or you didn't hear it, you have disobeyed, you have disobeyed. Hallelujah. Because if Pastor Tunde Bakari did not go to that Ikoyi club, maybe he didn't hear the instruction. Or maybe he heard it and said, what kind of stupid voice is this? The result, he would have missed it. So he would have fallen short because of disobedience. Whether he heard and did not respond, or whether he did not hear at all. Say, so today, if you will hear his voice, do not hurt in your, hurt in your hearts. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, the place of hearing the voice of God is in the place of communing with the Holy Spirit. That is where you begin to recognize his voice. You begin to recognize his workings. You begin to recognize his emotions. Now, to commune with the Holy Spirit, it takes you building a relationship with the Spirit. It's not like it's is a product of grace, but unlike the works of righteousness and salvation, it requires you to stay there. The word communion in first in first Corinthians, where we read 13:14, is translated from the Greek word koinonia. Koinonia has eight meanings in the English language. But because the English language is limited, some people, some translations picked communion, some other translations picked fellowship. But none of these two words actually encompasses everything that God was trying to communicate in that verse. That the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I'll tell us the eight meanings of koinonia before we close this evening this morning now koinonia talks one koinonia talks about partnership so you can also rewrite that scripture and say the partnership of the holy spirit be with you all now the next is participation now partnership and participation go hand in hand for those of us who have worked in business partnerships you will see that you cannot take a decision on the business alone. Because there is a partner that you are running the business with. So, before you take a business decision, you call the partners. Say, 
look at because of the recession we need to cut down our expenditure by 50 percent and try to push up sales but you cannot by yourself just lay off half of the staff it is not your decision to make so you you, you even though you feel it is the right thing to do you subject it to the partnership so if we're talking about the partnership of the holy spirit that means every decision of our lives is subjected to the partnership of the Holy Spirit. Because your life is no longer your own. You were bought by a, with a prize. So there is a partnership you are running. So it's no longer me just jumping up in the morning and say, I'm going to do X, Y, Z. You take a time of communion, a time of koinonia with the Holy Spirit. And participation talks about almost the same thing. Two people participating in the same thing. Because in the partnership, you are both participating. The koinonia of the Holy Spirit. <sighs> the next one, the next meaning of koinonia is intercourse. The next meaning of koinonia is intercourse. You know, one day I was just worshipping, I was just lost in worship. And the Holy Spirit said to me that the way you yearn for intimacy with your wife, that is the same way I yearn for your worship. So when I read this scripture, I checked up the meaning of koinonia and I saw, I hadn't even known this scripture then. When that came to me, I was, you know, there are some things the Holy Spirit will tell you. You have to prove it by the word before you can even start mentioning it publicly. I said, what has a man's intercourse with his wife got to do with the Holy Spirit? But we forget that we are the bride of God, of Christ. And the place of intimacy between a husband and a wife is a symbol of what God expects for the church. Because it is in the place of intimacy that seeds are introduced. And a fertile woman would incubate that seed and bet something tangible on the face of the earth. So it is in the place of communion, the Holy Spirit begins to inject ideas into you. Now, there are some things the Holy Spirit, there are some things you will never hear from the pulpit. There are some things that no prophet can ever tell you. You can only hear those things in the place of koinonia with the Holy Spirit. I see, fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit is not prayer. Prayer is part of it. It's not bringing a list of prayer requests. It's just sitting down and loving him. We want to talk about intercourse with the Holy Spirit. That is not the time to bring prayer requests. It's just a time of adoration. A time to just feel you falling in love with him. And being drawn to him. And what I've seen is that that is the time I have the deepest revelations of the word of God. Because that's what Jesus said. That when he comes, he will lead you into all truth. So that time, that's when you now begin to, 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 to receive. He begins to introduce seed into you. Seed of ideas. That when you incubate those ideas, you will bet something on the face of the earth. And the Bible says whatever is born of God overcomes the world. So those ideas, <laughs> see in the case of Mary, that seed became literally a person. And trust me, that person overcame the world. In the same vein, when the Holy Spirit introduces the, the seed of a business idea, the seed of any whatever idea into you, it has the capability of overcoming the world. But it is in the place of intercourse. In the place of koinonia. You make out time, you just sit there. 
and you begin to commune with the Holy Spirit. You begin to intercourse with the Holy Spirit. And it begins to drop these things in your mind. It begins to expound the word of God. It begins to show you scriptures that you have not heard thought anywhere before. Now, there are a number of things I was sharing in the marriage class yesterday that I have gotten in the place of fellowship, some revelation knowledge that, you know, you don't just get a revelation knowledge and jump out the next day and start teaching it. You have to prove it. And I'm sitting here, I haven't shared with anybody, maybe I've shared with my wife, and Pastor Dilly just comes here and he starts teaching the same things. And I'm like, I didn't hear this from anywhere. So, for Pastor Dilly to teach it, that validates my experience. So I learned to trust those things the more. So when the Holy Spirit is dropping those things in my spirit, I learned to take it more seriously. Hallelujah. Now that is the place of fruitfulness. It is not five minutes in the prayer, Father, we thank you for today as we go out, lead us out and lead us back in, in Jesus' name. Amen. You are off to the office. Till maybe the next day, if you remember, then you pray again. No. See, there is something we are pressing into in the baptizing church at this time. And it takes a time of extended communion with the Holy Spirit to bet these things. You just stay there. You know, I was reading Good Morning Holy Spirit by Benny Hinn. You know, I've not read, you know, I don't know why I hadn't read that book all this while. I've heard about the book so many times, you know. But when Pastor Chris said that, it was when he read that book that he came to understand some things. I said, I must, I must read that book. I said, there must be something in that book. And I got the book and I started reading. And what, what a fellowship. That's why Benihim will come and minister and you will open your mouth. Why not? Because he's, ah, fellowship, koinonia. And trust me, it's available to all. Because the Bible said the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Not an exclusive preserve of the class of Pastor Benny Hinn and Pastor Chris Oyakilome. Intercourse. That's the third one. Then it talks about communication. Koinonia means communication. So communication is that you're talking to me, I'm talking back to you. You know, a lot of times we spend time in prayers and we have not communed with the Holy Spirit. Because when you're standing upon your watch, you have to listen for what he will say to you. You have to listen for what he will say to you. Now, if you are not conscious of the fact that he can speak to you, you just go, rabababababam, it's good. You pray in tongues, pray, do all your prayers, and you dash out. But he hasn't said anything to you. Communication. You know, in the marriage class, we teach communication. There's a difference between a dialogue and a monologue. A monologue is that you are talking to somebody, or you are talking for somebody, or you are talking at somebody. But a dialogue is that you are talking with somebody. So you are, you are talking, you're getting response. And it's a position in the spirit that as you're praying, your spirit is scanning. Looking out for what he will say to you. Your tongue is moving in prayers and your spirit is scanning. And so but sometimes you are just quiet and you're just scanning with your spirit. And you begin to pick up signals. You begin to pick up promptings. He begins to talk to you. You might not hear a voice, but you start feeling a leading within your spirit. I know some people will ask, how do I know the voice of the Holy Spirit? That is not the question to ask. If you cannot recognize your father's voice, perhaps you are not your father's son. Because the Bible says, my sheep hear my voice. If you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, you will know. 
Because the spirit of God will bear witness with your spirit. You will know. But it's just that you don't trust it. So you are saying something said to me. I heard a voice. But ask the Holy Spirit. You need to trust that leading. Hallelujah. The next is, I'll take the next two together, benefactions and distributions. Now, benefaction is the act of receiving a gift or giving a gift. Hallelujah. And the distributions of the Holy Spirit talks about the distributions of the giftings of the Spirit. And the different graces, the diverse graces of the Spirit. And as I'm talking today, my words are not just hitting your ears. It's bringing an empowerment for you to experience what you're hearing. There's an, there's an impartation of the Spirit going on right now. And there are distributions of the Holy Spirit as I speak. Because the power of God is bringing this word alive in somebody's spirit. I am confident of it. Because the words we speak are not mere words of human wisdom. But demonstration of spirit and of power. And if there is power, it must cause change. It must cause something to happen. It must carry an ability to introduce something that was not there before. Or to bring to life something that was dead. For if this same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is at work in your mortal bodies, he will also revitalize your mortal bodies. He will quicken your mortal bodies. He will bring to life that which is dead. By the power of the Holy Ghost. The benefactions and the distributions of the Spirit. So in that place of communion, he begins to distribute gifts. He begins to release graces. That's why St. Paul said to Timothy, he said, fan into flame this gift that has been deposited on, in you by the laying on of hands. So there's something in you, but to get it to the point that it catches fire, you need to stay in the place of communion. Stay in the place of communion. Stay in the place of communion. The distributions of the Holy Spirit. He begins to distribute gifts. He begins to distribute gifts. He begins to distribute gifts. You start hearing, okay, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, prophecies coming forth, workings of miracles. By the same spirit, you begin to receive skills. For there are diversities of ministries. There are diversities of gifts. And there are diversities of activities. But it is the same spirit. Then the next meaning of koinonia is communion. Communion and fellowship mean about the same thing. Let me read what I wrote down. He said, communion is the sharing or exchange of intimate thoughts. This is the meaning I got from the dictionary. The sharing or exchange of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially on a mutual or spiritual level. Then fellowship talks about a friendly association, especially with people who share the same interest. So you see there is a sharing. In communion. There is a sharing. In fellowship. There is a sharing. You can never commune with the Holy Spirit. And remain the same. Something must drop. Something must be deposited. The communion. 
of the Holy Spirit. Be with you all. Bakasa kanda lebosh. Lebro si kanta libra kosha kanta libra gedoska. La si kamanda legede. Now that is when the Spirit begins to teach you. If you read the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 31. Now, this has been the plan of God. Let's read Jeremiah chapter 31 as we close. Jeremiah chapter 31. Then we'll link it with, with 1 John chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 31. From verse 31. He said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. In the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. He said my covenant which they broke. Though I was a husband to them. Says the Lord. He said but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days says the Lord. I will put my law in their mind. And this is called the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You know, the complete Jewish Bible, the rendition of that uh, um, uh, Romans chapter 8, it said, for the Torah of the spirit has set me free from the Torah of sin and death. For the Torah of the spirit. When God was communicating the Torah, you know, the Torah is the first five books of the Bible. When God was communicating the Torah, he was communicating spirit, but they were too dead to pick it. He said, for the Torah of the spirit has set me free from the Torah of sin and dead. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. He said, I will put my spirit in their hearts. And write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. He said, no more shall any man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sins. I will remember no more. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, verse 27. He said, But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and it's true. And it's not a lie. What the Spirit of God does is simple. He reveals God to you and he glorifies Jesus. That's why Jesus was thinking that he will not testify of himself. He will testify of me. He will take from what he has heard of me and he will tell you. The law of the spirit of life. Now that's a topic for a different day has set me free from the law of sin and death. And no more shall, shall it be said than know the Lord. For all shall know him. For he has written his law in our hearts. Let's rise on our feet as we begin to declare this morning. The distributions of the Spirit. The distributions of the Spirit. The distributions of the Spirit. The benefaction of the Spirit. 
I see graces being released here today. I see different anointings being released here today. In the name of Jesus. I just want to hear you praying in tongues. HMC, please, can you be on the stage just for one minute? 